You're watching ThoughtCast. I'm Jenny Atia, and I'm at the Harvard Bookstore in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Simon Johnson, the MIT Sloan professor and former chief economist at the IMF, is an outspoken critic of the establishment. His newest book on the financial crisis, which he wrote with James Kwok, is called 13 Bankers, The Wall Street Takeover and the Next Financial Meltdown. Simon Johnson, welcome to ThoughtCast. The 13 bankers in question are the villains of your book. Who are they and what have they done to earn your disapproval? <laughs> well, I wouldn't call them villains. I think they are symptomatic of a, of a much deeper problem that we have. They are the bankers who were called to the White House in March uh, 2009. Uh, the financial system was in serious trouble and it needed to be saved in some fashion. The Obama administration uh, told these bankers, who no doubt were delighted to hear, that they were going to be saved complete without any change in their salary, their bonus, their pension, their governance structure, their board of directors, um, their key staff, or their empires, actually. They were given the entire financial system, the power they have within the financial system that they'd ruined, <laughs> back on, on a silver platter, if you like. A and um, they were delighted, uh, of course. And, and they have gone about uh, re-establishing the same patterns of behavior that got us into trouble in, in 2008. Your book begins with a quote from The Great Gatsby. Will you read it? Yes. I'd like to hear a Brit reading this. <laughs> reading, reading, in a, reading The Great Gatsby? I'm not sure that's yeah. a, such a good <laughs> idea. Uh, they were careless people, Tom and Daisy. They smashed up things and creatures and then retreated back into their money or their vast carelessness or whatever it was that kept them together and let other people clean up the mess they had made. The implication, Simon, is that people who are privileged and powerful aren't held to account. They have a get out of jail free card. Yes, exactly right. Get out of jail free is exactly the right uh, notion, an exemption from the same sorts of constraints that the rest of us face. And I think that, you know, what Scott Fitzgerald was referring to is, is, is a perception of themselves and a perception of their own, I don't know, I don't know, is, is, is it their own greatness or their, certainly their own immunity um, from feeling bad um, and, and regretting what they've done. And, and of course, in the case of the 13 bankers, they've stayed on the job. They're still there. They're still going about the same kind of decision making that really almost brought down the global economy. And that, that, that's extraordinary and, and extraordinary in a very bad way. And if you look at the compensation levels the bankers are getting at the moment, they're almost back to their pre-crisis highs. How did that happen? <laughs> well, when they were saved, they were allowed to go out and, and make money uh, as a way to recapitalize their business, as a way to rebuild their businesses. And when they make money, they feel uh, they're entitled to pay themselves very high uh, levels of compensation. Now, I think that's highly questionable, personally. I would separate those two things. And of course, the administration has become increasingly angry, actually, with these bankers for following the, such practices. Um, but uh, this, this is, I'm afraid, what, very much what you get with these people. Simon, what do you make of Obama's attempts at financial reform, the proposals as they stand at the moment? Uh, that they're, they're too weak. Uh, they're not, they don't really tackle the too big to fail problem. We have supported them consistently on the, the idea there should be a new consumer agency or an agency to protect consumers vis-a-vis -vis financial products. That's a good idea. And perhaps some version of that with some teeth will come through in the legislation. That remains to be seen. But on the issue of uh, what happens to these huge banks that are so big and so dangerous that if they fail, they threaten to bring down the rest of the financial system and the global economy, and therefore they force you to rescue them in some fashion, that problem is not really being addressed. And, and that, that, is, um, that, that, that is terrible. I believe that one way to sum up your thinking is that if banks are too big to fail, they're too big to exist. Yes, absolutely. It's a very simple slogan, if you like, but it's entirely uh, descriptive and accurate. Um, you should not allow banks, financial institutions of any kind, to become so big that if they fail, you can't allow them to go through the normal failure process, be that FDIC resolution or bankruptcy, um, because you're afraid of the um, consequences. You should simply make them smaller. It's not hard to do. It would not result in any economic losses that we or anyone else can document. And it is um, the obvious policy approach, but it is not the approach of this administration, that's true. Why not? I don't know, you have to ask them. I, I, you know, I think that in the book we, we, we argue, or we, we document really, I think it's un uncontroversial, the extent to which Wall Street has taken over uh, thinking in and around Washington with regard to policy 
uh, on the financial sector. You've written in the New York Times, Simon, that what we have here is, quote, a confrontation between concentrated financial power and our democracy. Those are strong words. No, I think that's where we are. I mean, Andrew Jackson, uh, Jeff, Thomas Jefferson warned about this at the beginning of the Republic. That was part of his debate with Alexander Hamilton. I think Hamilton won in general, and Hamilton was right on a lot of the economic issues, but Jefferson was right, in my view, on this key point that if you allow a financial aristocracy to develop, it will have adverse consequences. And Andrew Jackson faced this in the 1830s in his confrontation with the Second Bank of the United States. This was concentrated financial power. Jackson took it on and Jackson beat it. Teddy Roosevelt faced this at the end of the 19th century with J.P. Morgan and other members of what was then called the Money Trust. And Franklin Delano Roosevelt faced it in the 1930s. The 1920s boom and bust and then utter chaos and collapse was the outcome of an unregulated, unrestrained, irresponsible financial sector. Last question, Simon. If Obama doesn't break up these big banks, what will happen? What does the future have in store for us? Another major financial crisis. Look, there'll always be crises. There'll always be bumps in the road. We're not going to ban crises by any means. But the question is, what happens next time? Next time, you know, how big will it be? And if we don't fix this problem, if we don't deal with these underlying core, underlying political and economic issues that brought us to the crisis of 2008, 2009, then in all probability we will face something at least as traumatic, at least as difficult. And next time it could actually be much harder. As you say, the next financial meltdown. Right. Simon Johnson, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. You've been watching ThoughtCast. I'm Jenny Atia. Thanks for joining us.